Good afternoon and welcome to 365 Days of Amazing Stories with Theo Mayer. Here we are on day 259. Uh, it's a multiple of seven. It's a Saturday. And so I'm continuing with stories from my own life, my life as a steward. And the last week I was talking about volunteering and how important that is, in my opinion, in regards to learning new things. And what a wonderfully free way to do so. Volunteer your time. You can learn a lot of stuff. Um, so I talked last time about getting on board the Hispaniola and going out fishing um, on its maiden voyage, Albacore fishing. And then also meeting these two uh, boat builders, uh, Danny Malone and Tom McCurvy. And they, uh, you know, they were building a house, which is when I really started learning how to use carpentry tools and cut things. Even though my cuts weren't so good, I was working for free, so it didn't matter so much. <clears throat> but I wanted to share with you one story uh, about Tom and Danny working together and how cool it was to be friends with them. So I worked on a lot of boats <clears throat> back in that time period. So I had a dive business and I also worked a lot on wooden boats, painting them and doing bright work. And there was one guy that I worked on his boat a lot. He had a beautiful wooden boat called Vin. And this was for Steve Gann, who was an amazing sailor and who um, won the Master Mariners race up in San Francisco, I think at least twice with Vin. It's a cool little boat. Um, and I used to do the paint job on the hull. I used to uh, hoist myself up, up the mast and varnish the mast. In fact, it was basically with Steve uh, who I first really got into working on boats. So I should tell that story as well. Um, somehow he found out about me. He asked me if I could repaint a hatch for him, the hatch of them. And I said, sure. Uh, and so he gave me the hatch to do the job. The truth was, I didn't really know quite where to begin. I knew I could do it, but I didn't know quite how I could do it. And so I immediately went over to uh, the chandlery, the, the place where you got parts for boats and chains and zinks for propellers and propellers and, you know, anchors and anything you needed, paint. I went over there. Jimmy Womble uh, ran the chandlery at that point. I can't even remember what it was called. And he had a guy working for him, Jack. He called him Captain Jack. And Captain Jack uh, used to skipper, he was captain of Tevega, the Tevega. The Tevega was the tall masted boat that was owned by Stanford University back in the day. Um, when I was a student there, they didn't have it. It would have been really cool to get on board that ship because it was a tall ship, you know, and had it was a square rigger. Um, and they sailed all over the place on it. Uh, I guess, you know, you could be a student. I think they did, you know, marine biology off of it and who knows what all else. Um, so, anyway, I went to Jimmy Wombles and talked to Captain Jack. And Jack told me exactly what to do in order to take care of that hatch and paint it properly. So I took it home and, you know, with a sander and hand sanding and doing all this, you know, I got the bright work done, I got the painting done, and I charged Steve for half of my hours because I felt like it wouldn't be fair to, you know, charge him for everything because I was just kind of learning. And after Steve saw the job that I did, because I did a freaking good job on it, he was like, he hired me to take care of them. All the bright work, all the varnish work on the wood, all the painting, top sides and the bottom paint. So uh, back in that day in Monterey, there are two wharfs, wharf number one, wharf number two. Wharf number two was considered the commercial wharf. There was uh, places where they processed squid and fish there. It's the place where we came into with our first load of fish on the Hispaniola after 22 days out at sea. Um, which was pretty cool. 
Our hold was completely packed. We had fish on deck. And it was quite a big deal to be the first boat in with albacore that season. We got the best price for them. Uh, anyway, so the other wharf was wharf number one. On wharf number one, it was like where there were restaurants, there were fish markets, and there was a place where you could haul boats out if they weren't too big. And, uh, oh God, Favalora, I can't remember, Tony, I think it was Tony Favalora, ran the boat hoist. Um, and so I had them hauled out, and I was redoing the bottom, and there was a fishing boat that had been pulled out that had sprung, uh, it had some cracked ribs. You know, the ribs, the ribs are in the inside of the hull, and then the hull, uh, you know, has hull planks all up and down it, and then there's a stuffing that's put in between the wooden hull planks that when the boat is submerged in the water, uh, both the wood and that packing swells up with water, and that's how wooden boats are waterproof if you're not using glue. It's a fascinating thing. Um, so anyway, this boat was hauled out, and a uh, fishing boat, and Danny and Tom were working on it. They were going to replace these cracked ribs. And so, you know, whenever we were there together, you know, there was some light discussion, and you know, it was fun to take a break and see what they were doing. I would hang out and watch because it was pretty fascinating. Um, so they got to the point, they pulled the old ribs out and they were ready to put the new ribs in, which were going to be oak ribs. And I show up that day and they get there and they've brought a bunch of kind of weird stuff. And we used to be able to drive out, you know, if we were working on boats, we could drive out that, that wharf, which you can't do anymore. Um, so they came out with, with their stuff loaded on one of their trucks and they had a long stovepipe, piece of stovepipe, probably, I don't know, at least 12 feet long. And they had a, a 90 degree at one end and then a little section of pipe and a cap. And they had a propane burner uh, that they placed the, the 90 degree part of the stovepipe, they placed that on the burner now, they loaded that thing with the, the oak boards that they were going to use for the ribs. Now, the, the hull of the boat had this incredible curve to it. Uh, it was a, more than a 90 degree, of cur 90 degree curve. And so they had straight oak boards. And they needed to have those oak boards conform to that curve. How do they do it? They were going to steam the oak, so they they pour water into the stovepipe. They ignite the uh, the propane burner. They start to boil the water in the stovepipe, and they've got these boards. They start loading them in uh, to the stovepipe, and they put little spaces in between so the steam can get in between the boards. I don't know how many boards they had in there, three or four. Um, and then, so the one end is capped, the short end, so no steam can come out there. The steam has to go somewhere, so they want it to go through that whole length of pipe. And at that far end of the pipe, they take a cloth and they completely close off the end of the pipe with a cloth. So the steam can't really get out. It can kind of migrate out a little bit, but the steam is kind of held in. And of course, it does come out. Now came the interesting part. By the time they have all this going on, you know, they're letting it kind of steam for a little while. They get all their tools set up so that when they do get the boards out and try to make them fit, uh, you know, they're gonna have everything ready, which included um, brace and bit drills. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have cordless drills back there then. They could have used a power drill, but they had a brace and bit drill because you want to go really slow with a wooden boat plank. You can't go through it and you're done. Um, and they had screws and um, I think they had, you know, power drills for putting the screws back in and pulling like the boards into place. They had clamps, they had hammers, to hammer the boards into place. Um, 
and they had set it up so as that board went in, it would, it would you know, contour properly. All right, so they get all this set up, and then they disappear. And they kind of say, Theo, keep your eye on, on this for us, you know, don't let anybody disturb it. And I'm sitting there working on Steve's boat, so it's not a big deal for me to, you know, keep my eyes on that as well. Well, they come back about 15 minutes later, and they'd gone over to one of the fish markets and they brought back clams, some mussels, some crab. Um, I can't remember what else they had, but things, seafood that you could steam. They take the cloth out, they rearrange the boards a little bit, and then they put their food inside the end of the stovepipe. And they repack it with the cloth. And now they sit and they're kind of chatting and they come over, see what I'm doing, you know, give their two cents as to how I could do it better or worse or whatever and joke around a little bit. And the time passes, they make sure everything's set up right. You know, they check their work out again. Um, and, you know, maybe 12, 10, 15 minutes have passed. They go in, they pull some of the seed fruit, fruit out. I think it was crab to start with. And they sit back and, you know, they've got a couple plates and they start to tear the crab apart and eat the crab meat. And then they take the mussels out and everything else. And, you know, then they put the cloth back in. And I think they both smoked at that point. They had a cigarette. And so, you know, these boards have been steaming for like over an hour at this point. And they pull one out, they test. It's kind of like a piece of spaghetti at this point. And they take it over to the boat. They leave the other ones in the tube. They take it over to the boat and just hammer it into place. They've got a ladder and it goes and it just bends. Bends like a piece of spaghetti right to the contours of the hull. And they've got their bracing bit. They start pulling, you know, the board in against the planks uh, with screws. And then they go to the next board and I think they had four, you know, ribs that they replaced. And, you know, one by one they're doing this. I'm just, you know, I was prepping. I know I wasn't painting. So I'm just watching this in kind of utter amazement because I've never seen anything like it before. Steaming wood and getting it to bend like that. Um, it, it, what an experience. And to have that closeness with these two guys and how was it all created? It was all created because I was volunteering. I was willing to volunteer my time, uh, you know, on the Hispaniola originally to meet these guys and then volunteer my time when they were building a house. And so, you know, I just got the direct view, you know, the sweet talk uh, about what they were doing and everything because I was an asset. I was an asset to them and had endeared myself through my volunteering of time. So. That was pretty cool. Those days of, of being on a boat, it brings me also um, to something that was done back in the day that I did with two of my boats that I own, two sailboats, called careening. Now, I checked with the harbor, because I, I, I sold my boat about three months ago. But I checked with the harbor if I could careen that boat. Of course, they said no, because careening involves hauling your boat up on the beach and then doing work on the boat while it is beached. Really cool practice. Not many places you can do it anymore. But, you know, I used to do my bottom that way. So next week, I'll talk about careening boats and we're gonna continue with the theme of volunteering because I had a number of other experiences that were incredible from volunteering. Okay, thanks for joining. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.